Hello and welcome. Today we'll be playing the Book Week Scotland role playing game by Adrian Barber digital festival a national celebration of all things reading and writing the game and resources are available to download from the scottish book trust website and if you're watching on youtube there should be a link in the description below so you'll be able to try it yourselves at home my name is harry connor i'm an author and illustrator i make lgbt graphic novels but i also work in storytelling games i was the illustrator for the adventure zone game and i wrote a book called into the dungeon which is like a choose your own adventure style book uh, and basically i'm really interested in storytelling games that are both fun to veterans and also really accessible to people who are totally new to the genre um, like the one that we'll be playing today if you don't know a role-playing game or rpg basically just means a game where you're playing as a character um, you might hear people say tabletop rpgs which is just to say like not a video game it's more like a board game or like improv uh, the most famous one is probably dungeons and dragons but there are loads of different kinds including games like the one we're playing today which um you don't have to remember a lot of rules for um personally i think that like collaborative storytelling telling stories together is um a very sort of fundamental part of human culture and can provide an opportunity for all kinds of different people like kids adults people who might not work creative jobs or get a chance to do that stuff day to day to like invent and play in a creative space um so today i'm joined by a selection of wonderful authors and comic writers um, and i thought i'd go around so everyone can just introduce themselves and their work we'll talk about your characters later you can just introduce your real flesh and blood corporeal forms now uh, i'm just going to go by the order of who's first on my screen um so first up i've got marjorie hello do you want to introduce yourself hi everyone uh, my name is marjorie Wu. Um, i'm a novelist and a comic book writer uh, my current series is monstrous with sonic takeda and i am so delighted to be here and i cannot thank you harry enough and the scottish book trust cool uh next up i've got val hello Hi, I'm Val McDermott. I'm primarily a crime novelist, um, but I've also done various collaborative projects involving drama, telling stories in different ways. And this year I published my first graphic novel with uh, Catherine, Catherine Briggs, who is a wonderful, wonderful illustrator. And we did uh, a graphic novel called Resistance, which was about a pandemic. Uh, no idea where that came from, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm enjoying um, the prospect of, of making a fool of myself with other people telling stories today. Good, same, perfect. Um, and next up, I've got uh, Ram, hello. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Ram V. Uh, I am a writer of comics and graphic novels predominantly, uh, but I've also written a few short stories here and there. Um, I used to be a chemical engineer until 2013, at which point I decided to drop all of that nonsense and start writing for a living instead. Uh, I've written books like Paradiso, Many Deaths of Light the Star, Black Mumba, uh, Blue and Green. Uh, and I also write uh, comics with superheroes and capes at DC and Marvel. Cool. Hello. And last time I've got Kieran. Hey. Hello, I'm Kieran Dillon. I am a mainly a comic writer. I'm a recovering games critic. I wrote about video games for everyone for like 15 years and then somehow found a way to write comics instead, which is fun. <laughs> um, I most relevantly i do but i just finished a book called die uh which is about uh a pr it's a portal fantasy about role-playing games and is basically why the hell do we play games anyway um uh, but i've done a lot of other work uh both my own and also much like ram for marvel and dc okay cool so before we get on to all of your character ideas which i'm very excited to hear about um we're going to jump right in with like an introduction so for now you are yourselves but we're in an alternate world where there's no global pandemic and you're all in edinburgh for like a book week scotland event happening tomorrow um and you've all just like met up to get a coffee to like get to know each other um there's a bit of wind because it's november in edinburgh and it's early evening so it's basically already getting dark a lot of shops starting to close up um, and you're walking along a street near the grass market and it suddenly starts to pour with rain so you're all looking around for a place to shelter um you see an alley that even those of you very familiar with edinburgh have never noticed before in your lives and there's a little glimmering light down at the end so you all duck down into the alley and down at the end you see a bookshop the sign above the door is like obscured with overgrown ivy, so you can't make out the name and the shop windows are all misted up so you can't see inside, but it's lit up warm and inviting and on the door you see a sign that says open. 
So you all hurry inside to get out of the rain and a little bell tinkles over the door as you shut it behind you. And you find yourselves in a room crammed full of books, new and old, stacked in piles on rickety tables in front of you, walls lined with bookshelves that extend like floor to ceiling everywhere. You see a couple of low corridors extending off, which are just lined with more books and sort of arrows pointing to like nonfiction, crime, different directions. Um, there's not a lot of people in the shop, but sitting behind an old fashioned counter, you see a bookseller who has um, like round gold glasses and short green hair and they look incredibly stressed they have this huge book it looks kind of like an ancient tome it's like um bound in battered old leather it has gilded edges it almost looks like sort of parchment pages with calligraphy and they're like flicking through it like they're desperately like looking for something um and on the other side of the shop there's a couple of tourists who are like frowning down at an old book it sounds like they're having an argument and before you guys really get a chance to get your bearings you distinctly hear one of the tourists say oh, i really don't remember there being a dragon in treasure island and the shopkeeper's head like snaps up and they hurry over they have they, they're in a wheelchair and they steer it between the um piles of books to like not knock everything over but they're hurrying there and as soon as they arrive they're like oh excuse me could i just see can I see that for a second? It's a very important special edition that, and they sort of snatch the book um, out of the tourist's hands. And then they go, oh, is that the time? It's actually closing time. We're actually closed up. It's a beautiful, you should get out and enjoy that. And they like usher the tourists out into the like dark rain pouring down Edinburgh Street and like slam the door behind them. And they turn the sign in the door to close. Now the four of you are still standing like dripping inside the shop. Um, you can see that the book that they've snatched from the tourist is like a beautiful cloth bound edition of Treasure Island. It has like a block printed cover and there's very like piratey looking pirate on the front with like a parrot and um, a peg leg. And there's a couple of other characters, but in the background you notice there's like a sailing ship off in the distance that looks like it's being crushed by an enormous scaly claw. And behind the pirates there's actually a huge gaping toothy moor, yawning wide. Um, it actually obscures most of the title. Not what you would expect from the cover of Treasure Island. And the books are like notices you looking and glances down and it's like, oh God, and like flicking through this book as well. Um, now, I think all of you have like Book Week Scotland, like lanyards or badges on or something. Um, or maybe they just recognize you because you're all very famous or um, maybe you all just look like huge like nerds, but something they like notice in all of you, like the capability to um, adventure. And they look up at you and go, I really need your help with something. Which I assume you say yes to. <laughs> um, so they are like bringing you through the shop um, into the back room and um, they've picked up the like great big book and they're like wheeling along and they're sort of like chatting to you going like obviously I wasn't expecting the spell book to be real I thought it would be like kind of a fun joke like read out with some of my friends and but as soon as I like finished reading it there was all the lights went out the shop was plunged into darkness the book levitated into the air with an eerie glow and so all of the books in the shop started flying off the shelves and floating around and there were ribbons of text flowing out of all of the books and you know I was like knocked out by one of the books and when I finally came to the shop was a mess but worst of all something was wrong with the books and a bunch of the characters were imbued with the magical power to go into other books and some of them were really causing like all kinds of chaos to the plots um i found another spell that let me go into the books try and put everything back to right so all week i've been like in and out sorting everything out persuading characters to go back to where they belong but my creative energy is basically all used up and as they look at the cover of treasure island again the, the dragon's uh, enormous mouth has got closer to eating Long John Silver and they go, I, I really think I need a whole team for this. So they have brought you into the back room and like cleared off books from the table and they're getting like tea and biscuits and all of you are sat down uh, and they give you like character sheets and all of you make your characters um, for your magical voyage into Treasure Island. Um, so now I'm going to go around and ask you guys about the characters that you've made. Um, 
we're like basing this on again the Scot book week scotland rpg so in that each character has like luck um and so if you want to describe like your luck or your character strength and a character weakness and your name and stuff that would be amazing um so marjorie do you want to start us off hi you bet hi well, that was a beautiful introduction. Oh my gosh, I love this bookstore. I want to hear about your adventures. <laughs> All right, so, so everyone, friends, friends, I am an elfin smuggler named Lady Vex, who was betrayed by my sister and captured by the authorities. Before I could escape, the tips of my ears were cruelly sliced off in punishment for my crimes. And though my ears have healed, they still ache in the slightest bit of cold. So I wear, wear hats, even in the summer, you know, to keep my ears warm. Now, do I want revenge against my sister? Not anymore, as that bad elf's plot to take over my business went down in flames. My sister wasn't very good at the smuggling business. And so she crashed the ship against the rocks and she was eaten by mermaids. Now, I must tell you, I definitely don't know these mermaids and I definitely don't host their karaoke parties. I just wanna be really clear about that, right? I have, however, given up the smuggling game and I have invested my own stash of buried treasure in opening a small shop that specializes in rum-based desserts, such as coconut flan with rum or tortuga rum cake soaked in rum syrup with a vanilla glaze or my personal favorite, rum mocha walnut layer cake so that said i am very good at sneaking into places unseen sneaking into places where i shouldn't be and uh my luck is not being seen um but i'm terrible at fighting so i kind of try to avoid that at all costs okay um amazing thank you um so I, I think we'll just run through all the characters first and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about like your goals and how we're going to play. Um, so um, Val, hey, do you want to tell us about your character? Yeah, I'm George Stevenson uh, and I am a Bow Street runner, uh, which means I am a very early policeman, as it were. Uh, I catch thieves and sometimes I hold them to ransom and essentially say, give me the loot and I'll let you off the hook. Uh, but uh, I have a particular personal connection to this book because by a strange twist of time, I am an ancestor of Robert Louis Stevenson and I cannot bear what has happened to his book. And so I regard it as my personal obligation to get this dragon out of Treasure Island. I don't care where it ends up, but it's got to get out of this book and go someplace else that it belongs. Uh, I am, I'm, I'm clever. I'm clever as a corkscrew. I have a twisted mind. Uh, my strength is that I'm good at getting people to tell me things and finding clues is my luck. But I'm also a coward. So I don't like to fight either. But the other side of that is that I can run away very fast. Okay, amazing. And you're like a um, 18th century, so like progenitor kind of ancestor of, yeah, okay, perfect. Um, great. Uh, Ram, hey. Hey, so uh, my character is a 18th century pirate, uh, ex-pirate with his uh, exploits largely being in the Bay of Bengal area uh, with trading ships coming into the um, sort of southeastern coast of India. Um, he has had good times um, stealing, stealing booty off of these ships. Um, he is a well-traveled pirate and cartographer uh, who has largely decided that his seafaring days are over and so decided to open up uh, his very own pawn shop in a, in a suitably seedy pirate city, if you will. Um, but things have not gone very well. He owes far too many people far too many debts uh, and hasn't collected nearly enough. Uh, he, he, he is uh, slippery as an eel, so rather good at getting out of tight spots, uh, near death escapes and, or even talking his way out of a bad situation. Uh, his luck is one of uh, direction. So he kind of always kind of knows which way to go, uh, even, even if he's lost. Um, 
but his great weakness is that he can't resist a gamble. Uh, and so he's forever tempted by the promise of greater reward, and it has led him down some very regrettable paths. Um, so yeah, so that's that's my character, uh, and his name is Whistler. Great, cool. Um, Kieran, hello. Hey, well, I imagine fictional Kieran Gillen sitting down with the character sheet and immediately kind of being the slightly, being the typical writer, oh, I've researched something, I'm going to use something I've researched. He remembers that, you know, St uh, Stevenson, he was a big, he played war games, early war games in, in his bedroom. He was wrote about in magazines and uh, with his nephew and had all these little toy soldiers. Except there's this weird thing that he, um, there's a wonderful bit where like relatives come up and they discover him playing toy soldiers with his nephew and he gets very embarrassed. So the idea of like, what about one of these toy, toy soldiers who's just really embittered that, uh, that Stevenson was ashamed of him? Hence is born Osborne, the uh, the toy soldier, a, a living lead toy soldier uh, with a uh, like chip. The paints coming off a bit. He's a he's been in a thousand battles. He's somehow survived them all, mostly intact, bar some score marks. And he's come here to either set the record straight or get get his ju get his just reserves. His um his luck is he he's he's an expert warrior. He knows everything about winning battles. He can give orders. You know he's he knows everything. His major disadvantage is he's about 10 centimetres tall. <laughs> so anything which involves being bigger than 10 centimetres tall is a problem for him. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of how I mostly I see people carrying around in, his, in people's pockets. He's kind of that, that side and side. Yeah. OK. Um, amazing. Um, so one thing that I would say is that um, you can try to do anything in this game um but if it's going to be um this is something i'm adding from the original game um because we're all playing in this um in this call as uh if there's something that you try and do which is like far-fetched or uh, beyond the scope of what might happen in treasure island say perhaps you're from like a fantasy world and you're like an elf and you want to try and do some magic or something um i'm gonna make you roll just like a regular six-sided dice um to rep which is going to represent whether the text is able to like smoothly incorporate your wild idea into the narrative or not um the bookseller tells you that your goals are to get to treasure island find the dragon and persuade the dragon to go back home where it belongs. Um, the dragon is still imbued with this magical power um, to move through books, so it can do that itself. Um, they kind of theorize that if the dragon is left in Treasure Island for too long, it might start spilling out into reality. So dragons begin to appear in every copy of Treasure Island, um, ruining countless students' book reports, um, eliminating the Muppets film from history, like radically changing Tim Curry's career and a kind of butterfly effect. Tolkien accused of plagiarism, maybe your reality starts to unravel. Who knows what will happen to the world as we know it. Um, and the last thing they tell you uh, is that this is a stealth mission. So you are trying not, if possible, to disrupt the course of the story. Um, the plot of Treasure Island, you kind of want to run as smoothly as possible. So if you can avoid making drastic changes or interfering with like central characters in the plot, um, that's what you're supposed to be doing um but that stuff i think will be it'll be more easier like to understand like as we play how that stuff is um gonna work out but um again you're very welcome to do anything and you can also like make up extra stuff from your character's past like bring in new ideas it doesn't have to be something that you just told me just now about your character um so the bookseller gets you all to like, I don't know, like join hands and like lights a candle and they're reading out a spell from the book, like a seance or something. And all of you put your character sheets in the middle of the table. And at first you think nothing is happening. And then the room gets darker and darker. And before you know what's happened, you have awakened somewhere new. You are on a very small sailboat. Um, rising and falling on choppy waters. It is night. The moon is covered by clouds, so it's pretty dark. And um, the waves are, the boat is going really up and down on these waves um, that are almost taller than a person. Um, in the distance, you can see like huge storm clouds. And I think, um, Marjorie, is your character was a smuggler at sea, right? Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, so I think that um, Whistler and Lady Vex know that like there is a big storm coming and the boat that you're in, the three of you 
plus whoever's um, pocket Osborne is in. Um, pretty much like the size of the book is just big enough for you three. It has a sail, but it's like little, it's like a rowboat. There's oars in the bottom. Um, and so, yeah, the characters who are experienced at sea, um, I think, yeah, you know that this is a bad place to be um, in a storm. Um, there is a flash of lightning and I think probably George like notices that in the distance you don't see any land you're completely in the middle of the ocean but you do see a much larger ship and um, a little way off um like rolling and pitching in the waves so what do you do um you said there was absolutely no land no you don't see any land well it's clear then we have to make for the ship um I think I think we're safer, obviously safer in the bigger ship uh, than we are out here being tossed around at sea. Did I misread this book? Treasure Island? Isn't there meant to be an island? Isn't isn't that one of the major parts? Yeah, so you, so your first thing that you're getting to is you have to get to the island. Sorry, I, I mean, think character is a joke. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's good. Um, I was gonna actually say that your character maybe like notices as you get a bit closer you're like this is the hispaniola like this is the ship going to treasure island i think that if you've been around while stevenson was like writing i think you maybe have like insights into the plot in a way that the others maybe don't this one's important i think yeah I vaguely remember this one we should <laughs> get aboard and away from the water i, I must explain i'm made of lead you have no idea how frightened I am right now. Whistle, I would suggest that we, we turn the boat against the wave and we start rowing hard towards that ship. Also, let's make for a part of the ship where it's easier to sneak on board. Uh, we might not be welcomed very easily. Yes. I think, I think we, should, we should tie Osborne to a piece of rope and throw Osborne onto the deck. And Osborne can secure the rope to the deck, and then we can sneak up the rope once we get close enough. Mm. A boarding Excellent action. idea. Yes. I, okay. That seems, that seems reasonable. I've, I've been involved in many boarding actions in my time. <laughs> so, like, uh, jumping aboard ship by myself, I, I'll tell you the story later. <laughs> not, you put your not, vo not volunteering to throw a rather heavy piece of lead up high onto a ship. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that... Um, Lady Vex and um, Whistler successfully, we've established that you're good, but see, you successfully like navigate the boat, um, sort of like zigzagging through the waves to get closer to the larger ship. And yeah, I think you do see like ropes hanging off the edge of the ship that you think you could probably get close enough to try and like grab onto um, or pull down. I, I very chivalrously hold the rope uh, and, you know, motion for anyone who wants to go up first to do so. Well, my luck is not being seen, and I say, Osborne, would you like to join me? Oh, You're muted. I think it's probably best. We work well together. Sure. So I'll put you in my little pocket, and psh, 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 psh. Yeah, great. You can climb, so the rope kind of like goes up over the lip of the ship and on board, I think you can see there's a lot of chaos. It seems like maybe the people on board were like not really ready um, for the storm. So you just hear like people like running about, they're kind of busy. Again, it's pretty dark. You can see a couple of lanterns kind of swinging, um, but uh, most people on board are pretty are pretty busy. You, do you go like up over the lip of the ship or are you gonna toss? Are you going to do your plan to like toss Osborne? Well, I'm already at the top, but I can't be seen yet. So I reach into my pocket and I gently um, and courteously lift Osborne out and place Osborne on the rail because I assume he can he can get in um, also unseen and he can do a little scouting before I throw myself overboard. Yeah, be my absolutely be my pleasure as I sort of imagine. I make quite a heavy noise almost as I land uh, and then sort of move around, looking around, you know, making sure no one's going to come. But I'm not sure what I'm going to do if they do. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that like, so you have a lot of uh, war game military experience. And I think that you decide that it's like, it's a very inefficiently run ship. Like the people are not really following the captain's orders. They're just like scrambling around. Um, you know, I think you're like disappointed by the level of organization here um, on the ship. Um, there's 
um there's like people up aloft like scrambling around that's like a um there's the main deck and then there's um two like a raised bit there's like the forecastle and like the quarter deck at the back um you can see kind of over there on the other side of the deck there is a hatch um that goes down into the ship um most of there's like a few people clustered around a rail on the other side there's the captain up on the quarter deck it seems like yelling orders aloft um but there's no one like directly in your way between where you are and the hatch that goes below i give it sort of a lean back to lady vex <laughs> lady vex i think everyone can make it up here quite safely um what I'll shall I go down and make a little distraction and then you can all go down into the uh the hole over there. I think that's probably safe to get beneath that because if we're meant to be hiding, I'm not quite sure. I'd rather just charge and give him a bit of like steel or lead, as the case may be. I understand how you feel. Now, do you think you can cause a distraction without any risk to yourself? <laughs> Please, there's only 30 of them and one of me. I've defeated that odds many a time. Now, I guess the worst that happens, not that you would do this because you are the most courageous, the most. But I suppose as a last minute ploy, you could just always freeze and pretend that you are a toy. It's like uh, playing dead is certainly within my uh, level of skill, <laughs> Lady Bex. I'll see what I can do. Like... All right. And I, I think that um, we shouldn't all go below. Um, in my law enforcement career, I've discovered that often you have to hide and spy on people to get the kind of information that you need to acquire to carry out the plans you're planning to, to perform. So I think while you guys go below, I should climb into that barrel over there. It looks like, I think it might have apples in it. Is that apples in there, Osborne? Yeah. Looks like apples to me. Yeah, I can climb in amongst the apples and uh, you know just munch a few apples while I wait and see what's happening. Cool. So you are I'm all I'm definitely making... going below because <laughs> likely, likely where all the cargo is. Cool. So you're making this plan, like, uh, I guess, with Lady Vex, like, dangling over the side of the ship, um, and you two are in the little boat at the bottom. Um, as the waves are getting rougher, I think the boat is starting to, like, hit up against the hull of the much bigger ship. Um, it's getting quite, I mean, do you think that George is, like, good at sea? Has he been to sea before? Is this a new experience? No, he doesn't want to be at sea a minute longer. He wants to be up that rope. So, you know, Lady Vex, can you get a move on? <laughs> Clear the top of that rope so I can get up there and over and into the barrel of apples before everybody notices what we're doing. You bet, George. I am over <laughs> that rail. Cool. So is that Lady Vex is like sneaking onto the deck, like hiding behind things, making her way towards the hatch right away? Mm. <laughs> well, and... I will wait to make sure that Whistler and George make it over the rail safely. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess George is up next if he's not keen at being at sea. It's maybe a, quite a slippery rope, but if Lady Vex is there to help, I think you can probably all scramble up. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got Whistler prod prodding me from below, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. Okay, cool. I've also managed to look through various portholes to, to figure out where things are stored. Okay, so I think that Lady Vex, we've established, is like very good at not being seen. You're like hiding stealthily out of the way. You've like moved the rope to a place that you're like behind some like ropes and things. Um, I think that um, George may be less experienced at being at sea, but has like managed to get up and get over the railing. Um, yeah, Whistler does manage to look in through one of the portholes. Um, and you can see that you're around like the back of the ship and you can see there's like a bigger room and because like you know ships i think you know that this is like the captain's quarters um and you can also see through there's like another room it's not just one big one um underneath the like core deck uh there's another one that looks like it is um it's got like a table um with things laid out on it there's like uh sort of like sextants and um sort of navigational instruments like maps papers and stuff um and that's what you managed to see because i think that those rooms have got little lanterns that have been abandoned because everyone's hurried um mm. onto the ship um yeah so i think you make your way up um and all of you are successfully aboard while the little ship is getting like hit <laughs> <laughs> slowly broken to pieces against the hull as the rain gets like harder and harder there are people coming up and down the hatch 
like now and again, someone comes up and runs across the deck, um, but you are kind of like hidden amongst some stuff on the deck, including a barrel. Carl, to share the information about the captain's room, um, and I say I say to everyone, whispering, of course, um, it might be it might be wise to find out which way uh, the ship is headed, um, and it might be even wiser to find out what else is in the captain's room. <clears throat> so um, I I recommend making our way there as long as we're not spotted, of course. Cool. Um, and oh no, sorry. Go ahead. Did I interrupt anyone? No. Okay. Um, so I think that again, Osborne like knows this ship is going to Treasure Island, and you can like share that with everyone else, um, if you want to. I guess some people, uh, some of the other characters predate Treasure Island, but you can tell them like that you're going to the right place. Um, and I also think that um, Whistler knows that you already talked about you want to go and hide in the where the cargo is like you know that that would be a good place to like wait out the storm and that you will like kind of be going to the right place um yeah so do you start sneaking across the deck who's like leading the way is george remaining in the barrel on deck is your plan i'm going to stay in the barrel on the deck because i want to hear what the sailors are saying to each other what the captain's saying to each other about where we're going and where how how close they are to the destination okay how they figure they're going to get through the storm and get to the island so i can communicate this information to my colleagues who are below by spying out the lay of the land below decks okay cool um i think you can hide yourself in this barrel i think you do that um are you used to like sneaking around and hiding while you're trying to get clues is that your style or that's, is it, it? that's that's how we that's how we bow street runners uh, capture our, our villains we we hide we sneak um we listen we overhear uh, and then we figure things out because we have these we minds like corkscrews we are very smart but we're twisted cool and so do you like are there there are are you imagining like there are apples in the barrel you're like putting the apples over the top of yourself yeah. you there are apples in the barrel i'm pulling them over the top myself there's quite a few apple cores in here because obviously other people have had the same idea of hiding in the apple barrel and helping themselves <laughs> um but uh, it's 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 okay in here uh, and at least it's not in the storm okay great so you are so you think successfully hidden um in the barrel on deck um so Lady Vex, are you sneaking? I am sneaking. Um, I am trying to keep an eye on Osborne. Mm -hmm. You know, want to make sure that, you know, because Osborne is, is a, an amazing scout. I know this. And so, you know, I'm looking for any warnings from him. Um, but otherwise, I'm keeping to the shadows. It's a dark and stormy night, but I have been through worse storms. Cool. And Osborne, are you still like scouting around on deck? Are you in someone's pocket now? Like? I reckon I should probably have come back after scouting around, and I'm, I'm probably in Lady Vex's pocket, like in a crow's nest. Like that's the that's the kind of level of extra looking around yes. I'm doing. Okay, cool. Um, I'm sneaking with them, uh, and I will stay up until until uh, Lady Vex and Osborne are both down the hatch. Yeah. Um, would you say that you're experienced sneaking around trying not to be seen with yes uh, i mean i would certainly say i am experienced enough to do it on board a pirate ship yeah okay so you know the layout of the ship like you know the masts the sail like you're looking at the ship and you're like oh this is a like a two-masted topsail schooner and i know yeah, that exactly. if you go down here it'll take you to the yeah okay um so i think with your knowledge of knowing where everything should be um you are able to like duck behind things. I think Lady Vex has no trouble if she's very used to this um, and is able to like duck down the hatch when no one seems to be there. Um, so I think that you three have successfully made your way down. Um, I think we'll come back to George in a little bit. Um, the room that you find yourselves in is again, very dark. Um, it's not very big. Uh, you can see, oh, I guess because again, you guys like have been at sea um you know that the there's like big columns with like chains around that you know are like anchor chains mm. there's like ropes um there are a couple of um cannons that have all been like tied down and like closed gun ports in this room mm. um 
you can see in front of you, like not that far away, another hatch leading down. Um, there's sort of over to your left, there is a door behind you that you don't hear anything coming out of. Um, up ahead of you, there's like a corridor leading off on the left as well as the hatch on the right. And you can hear stuff from the corridor on the left. You think you can hear people like kind of just like laughing and messing around actually is what you hear. Um, and there's more like lights, more lanterns up that way. Um, and you also don't hear anything from the patch that goes further down either. Now, Whistler saw the captain's quarters through the portholes when he was coming up, was yes. scaling the rope, correct? Uh, so those are on, you can get to those from the main deck. It's like the main deck has the little extra quarter deck. And if you go uh -huh. through the door there, that'll lead you into the captain's quarters and stuff. You are now below on the lower deck. Got you. Um, also, um, if we are in the place where the cannons are, there must be barrels of gunpowder. So can I pack two, two tiny things of gunpowder? So I think you don't find any gunpowder immediately next to the cannons. There's kind of like rain coming down and stuff. Um, I think you also probably know that like, that it's probably like locked away somewhere. Um, maybe especially if it's like a crew that's like disorganized or like not, um, maybe a crew that some people like don't trust other members of the crew, it's going to be hidden away somewhere. But you do, seeing the cannons, know that there will be gunpowder like somewhere on this ship for sure. I imagine if we are to get to the captain's quarters at some point, um, we might need a distraction or two. Well, the, uh, the other thing, as I would say, is I think that like um, Osborne knows that when the ship gets to Treasure Island, some people are going to go ashore. Like at some point, there's going to be a lot less people on the ship. At the moment, um, you can hear clattering at the, like you've only just arrived down. So there's no one coming through where you are right now, but it's kind of only a matter of time. There's quite a lot of people squeezed onto the ship at the moment. Well, I imagine if we want to hide, the best place to do would be the cargo hold, so. Yeah, you, you think that the hatch leading down probably is the cargo hold. It's like dark and quiet down there. So like, I think you hear footsteps approaching and you can easily go down that hatch if you want to. Meanwhile, up, 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 up on the deck, the weather is starting to clear a little bit. Um, and a couple of midshipmen are, are, are leaning against the barrel saying, now the storm's clearing off a bit. We should be able to make it to the island in the next half hour or so. Once we get past that reef at the mouth of the bay, uh, we can't see it just now because of the storm, but it's, we know it's there. It's on the maps. Um, and so that storm should start to subside now. Uh, and thankfully, we should be in harbour before too much longer goes past. I think this, it, this does happen, but I think it's going to happen a little bit like further in. That's like a little vision of the future. Soon we're going to see all the storm um, like dying down and um, I think you'll get a chance where you will be like hearing stuff going on. Um, right now, while the storm is still going on, um, I think that you guys can be making your way down into the cargo hold. If yeah, I vote, I vote going yeah. down to the cargo hold. Is that what Lady Vex and Osborne are coming down as well? Yes. I'm I have limited options. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but Osborne, if you wish to scout, in different places, please let us know. I think it's a risk. Our mission is to get to, if we can get to the island, we can get off at the island. The real yes. risk is being discovered before we get to the island. I think we need the, the best safety, uh, the best hiding place we can find. For me, that's any space less than 10 centimeters. For you, it's a, it's a more difficult task, but I'll leave it in your very capable hands. Then, then we shall go into the cargo hold. Yeah, I think as you hear people approaching, you guys will hurry down the ladder into this very dark room. Um, you can, um it's it's not super big um but you can see uh barrels and crates um you can see there are stores as well of like tools there are like ropes and sailcloth mm. and pumps and things um like again you guys like know what this is and you see some food provisions as well um there's also another door going through to another bit of the cargo hold so it's like dark here but you also where the trap door is going down um, 
yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna root through whatever open provision crates to to see what I can take on my person without it being too too uh, uh, cumbersome to carry. GM, is there a machete or a, a hammer in, um, in these boxes? Yeah, I think you can find a hammer among the tools and stuff. Um, I think that um, Whistler can find like rope if you want to take rope with you. You can probably like sure. tie it around you. Um, and you can find like ship's biscuit and like salt pork. And I think probably it's it's food that's like beneath what Lady Vex would really like with your like tastes from your dessert shop um but there's like food there's like fresh water um there's a certain amount that you can probably like wrap up in something and take with you i look i look at lady vex and i say i bet there's rum though there's rum so, life is good <laughs> i feel like so the, the main room you're in right now you don't find like rum and stuff but again there is like there's a door um, right. which you can head through so you can either like hunker down here or you can like check out I was saying, like, whilst um, Whistler's clearly going to get fired, Whistler's clearly going to be shot by a firing squad if I've got anything to do with it. <laughs> but, like, I, I'm still, like, ask Lady Vex to put me down. I'm going to go back and get George, because I reckon it's going to be much safer to hide around here than in a barrel, just because it's a... Uh, I've realised we're going to be here for a while, so I want to go back and rescue George. Yeah, okay. I think... Or, like, I really... at least tell George the suggestion of joining us. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that, like, I really like this idea that George is hiding and finds out more information. And we can do a bit of a, like, fast forward, if we want, of you guys, like, looking around in the cargo hold. I think you can definitely go back up to George and, like, tell him what's going on. Um, I think that... Um, if you guys are hunkering down, like in the cargo hold, um, you can, I think. Uh, I also encourage Lady Vex to look through the next doorway because she's particularly good at looking through things without being seen. Hmm. Yeah. I'm okay. happy to do this. Um, there's like, it's another really dark room. You think it might be a good place to be in because it's just not immediately where the hatch opens up to. And there's another couple of like locked doors. Mm. So again, Whistler, you think there might be gunpowder somewhere. This could be. I, I've got the hammer in one hand and I'm creeping up to those locked doors and putting my, my ears to them, my ear to them to listen. Mm -hmm. You don't hear anything down here. There's like a lot of commotion above, people all running around, but it is pretty like dark um, in the cargo hold. It's like pretty quiet. You can hear the ship like creaking. The deck is really like moving around as this storm is like blowing through. Um, but yeah, you don't hear anything down here. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um... I'll wait, I'll wait till everybody's in here into, into the relatively unvisited cargo area. So okay, cool. So you guys are down in the relatively unvisited cargo area. Um, I think that up on deck, um, you can hear, um, mostly what you hear, George, is commotion. Um, and you hear a lot of like shouting. It sounds like the captain is like angry. Um, and you actually hear him go like, by the provision barrels up on deck at this time. We need everything needs to be buttoned. Get a move on, please. And you actually feel the barrel being like lifted. <laughs> I think that probably the people lifting it like don't maybe hmm, don't notice how heavy it is. Maybe I might get you to roll your dice actually, so that we see. <laughs> hey, I'm rolling the dice, and I've got I've got a one. Okay, um, I think, do you want to tell me like how good you think George is at being completely silent and pretending to be hidden? George is fundamentally a coward. Mm, okay. George will take what it, do what it takes to avoid being discovered somewhere he shouldn't be. So what I do is I stuff an apple into my mouth. Mm, okay. Which means I'm less likely to scream. So I think that the one means that like they do notice this barrel is really heavy. They thought people had eaten most of the apples. And as they're like pulling it over to go down the hatch, one of them opens it up. But so cowardly are you that you're like there, the apple is like completely in your mouth and you're completely like covered up, like hiding right at the bottom. That the guy looking in, in like the darkness and the wind and the rain kind of like tries to like move one of the apples. It hits, his hand like hits the one in your mouth. Um, 
but he just sees apples so he just like closes it up again i think you're probably a little unlucky in that they do take this barrel and move it down to the lower deck um and not to the cargo hold they you are taken um i think if osborne tries to come up you're not in the room that you were in before um you don't see this barrel on the deck it's like somewhere else in the ship but i think yeah you do hear while the others are like poking around and like hiding out in the hold i think some time passes as you said like the it all like dies down a little bit um and you do hear a couple of sailors like talking um saying that like yeah you're getting close to the island soon and they're expecting the storm to all blow, or blow over and like by morning it'll all be fine like you'll have reached the island and it's all good um and you are still you're being jostled and eventually you come to like a stop um and i think that you're in like a room that feels fairly quiet um and you know again that it won't be like that long until morning when you get to the island um but you are not in the same place as everyone else and I look around, I, I try to look around me because I know that there are some knot holes in the barrel because I noticed that before. So I try and squirm around in this load of, of apples. And it's not very comfortable because although apples are round and, and relatively small, they're still really hard. So every time I move, apples stick into a different part of me. And I imagine I'm going to be bruised all over at the end of this because, you know, I'm a bit melodramatic about things like that. Um, but eventually I do find uh, a little knot hole that I can see through. And I might as well not have bothered because I can't really see anything at all except an empty space. Though I think I can see the edge of a door towards the outside edge of my vision. Um, so I think maybe... Since I can't see anybody or hear anybody, I should risk standing up in the barrel and looking over the top and see what I can see. So I do that very yeah. slowly with the strange sound of rattling apples. Uh, <laughs> and I peer over the top and it is a small empty room apart from a couple of other small barrels that look like they might contain beer. Yeah, I think you're in, you're in a room with like other supplies and stuff you do see one door i think leading out of the room um i think um i guess meanwhile like osborne if you've gone up to the deck and you found that the barrel is gone are you now like searching the ship i think a lot of i probably immediately rush back to tell everybody else and in a, not a panic you know this is all just reconnoitre this information as if we've lost one member of our party you know one member of the unit we can't leave anyone behind we've got to find george um, and I look at them as I imagine like Ram's got sorry yeah, Whistler's got half the ship stuffed in his pockets, <laughs> you know. And like we we need to find George. George is important. We need we need George. And then I I immediately go start searching the ship uh, without even thinking anyone's following me because I presume they will be helping obviously because they're all good people. I join Osborne. Yeah, join Osborne much. immediately. I will I will use my uncanny ability to find things find the direction in which things might be to potentially guess where they have put the <laughs> apple barrel. Yeah, okay. You think that if the apples were going to be somewhere, they would maybe be by the like galley, like near the kitchen and stuff. You think that probably the noises that you heard you know ships, I think we've established you can have some sense of what's going on is people like eating and drinking near to this and in fact i also think that um george can see that the room that you're in is quiet but the door opens on to a room of people who are like sitting they just look like they're like sitting and drinking actually like they're just like chilling and like laughing um and i think that um yeah i think that osborne can also see that like you find an area that's like eating and drinking could be where apples are going to be and you also see all of these people there um it's like it's the, it's the core so i think that it's the corridor that led off on the lower deck right so is is osborne's barrel closer to us or across the kitchen <laughs> it's a like there's like it's a little room that goes off the galley mm -hmm. at the moment there are people there um right. osborne you've seen them you it's, it's it's quite a lot of people 
And I, I know that earlier you were talking about making a distraction. You thought that like, that could be a, that could be a plan. Hmm. But it's like, but also I'm wondering if we, if anyone's really going to have apples at this time of day. So might, might we be better with uh, just keeping an eye on Osborne's barrel and, and letting Osborne sort of listen in on conversations potentially. Well, I'm, I'm quite happily listening because now that they've, they've started to stop and eat and drink. Sorry, George's barrel. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Obviously, now that the, if they're taking the time out to sit and eat and drink, then the worst of the storm must be past. Um, and there's a cabin boy who seems to be not very familiar with the ways of, of the ship, not as familiar as the, the rest of the, the pirates. And he's basically asking people what they think is going to happen now. And, and they're, they're talking about the winds dropping and the rain's not so heavy. And really, they should be able to start to, to get the, the telescopes out and send someone up to the crow's nest to get a better sense of how close we are to where we should be which is apparently close to the island itself. Um, so the cabin boy is very excited about the prospect of making landfall after all this time of, of voyaging and maybe being closer to the, the treasure. Yeah, I think you hear people say, like, it, it definitely seems like the storm will be over in a few hours. So I think that it's kind of up to George whether you're going to try and, like, wait in this room for a little bit longer um, or if... Um, you know, Osborne or the rest of you are going to try and make a distraction and try and like all gather down in the hold. Um, but it's not going to be like that long before you're going to be closer to your destination. Hmm. I, I do look to Osborne for for leadership here. Do we do we create a distraction and no man left behind, or do we do we just bide our time? Hmm. Night missions always very dangerous. That's that's the thing. As in, we could have, we could have, we've lost one person already. Like, I don't think we're not meant to do anything like, for example, blow up the armory, which is my always my instinct. Uh, we probably that's probably not in the plot of Treasure Island. I, I, I know, yeah. but, but maybe the distraction comes from beyond us. Yeah, I, I, I think the, that the, the roaring of the wind has died down. Mm. Um, even from below, we can hear that the roaring of the wind has died down, but there is now another roaring that's replaced the wind. There's the sound of roaring up in the air beyond the ship. And down below, we have no idea what's going on, but the guys in the galley have an idea what's going on because they have run out of the galley, left their food and drink on the table and disappeared up onto the deck. I feel we're gonna get to some of this stuff. I definitely like that. I just, for like, for like the pacing of how we're gonna go, um, but yeah, I definitely think that like if you guys below, um, apart from Osborne, your instinct is to like hide, you can absolutely do that. And I definitely do think that like after a few hours, the storm is going to clear, you guys are going to be closer to the island and you can just wait and gather more information there. Um, if you think that's going to be in character, George, we can definitely do that. It's going to be like a little, a little while before all of this stuff happens, but you can just like wait it out. I think if that's what you want to do, you can do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly happy with waiting either until we get to the island or until there is an opportunity for us to create some sort of distraction. To... Given, the, given the, the small confines of the ship, given how few good places there are to hide, and given the fact that our senses, you know, that we are not supposed to disrupt the story of, of Treasure Island, um, I would be inclined to wait, but keep an eye on things, you know, keep keep our like ears open to make sure that George is okay. Because of course, um, if George should be discovered, we will have to perform a rescue. But right now, George seems to be in a, a fairly safe, quiet area. Yeah. Okay, cool. If that's what we're doing, let's yes, go I that. smile we and nod at the notion of a rescue. <laughs> cool. Um, I think that uh, I kind of like the idea that Osborne is like, we've already lost someone. <laughs> You know, it's too late. This is Bye. a military operation. <laughs> it's happened. Um, See ya. <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely like the idea that George is wanting to like find out clues and you definitely will get some like more information there. And if you guys are like, you're good at hiding. Um, and if 
if Whistler is like used to being cowardly, you can you can hide out in the bottom of the ship. That's no problem. You can hide out in that little extra room off to the side. Um, and so, and the, and the ship does, it carries you closer and closer. And by the time that like morning has come, um, George has still been like totally quiet in this little side room and no one has come in. Maybe you've like got back in the apple barrel if you heard footsteps. Um, but um, after a while you do hear like people have started to like clear out. Um, and um, I think you hear um, someone kind of shouting as like the footsteps are moving overboard. George hears someone going, um, yelling down at someone who's like still seems to be hanging out in the kitchen, um, going, Davy, Tam says boats taking the crew ashore. It's leisure time. Come on, lad. And you've also heard like mutterings. You've definitely heard mutterings among the people who thought that they were like out of the way of the captain who's up above, um, talking about like a mutiny and stuff. And the cabin boy that you noticed running around, like excited to get to shore, is um seems a little more nervous like you managed to see through this crack in the door you see him like darting around um so you definitely think that there's like something is gonna break out but it is morning and you um the ship is much emptier you can hear it clearing out george you know that a lot of the crew has gone ashore um and the ship uh has like ground to a halt you hear the chains moving as they like put down the anchor um and you hear it's like much quieter um above um so actually we're gonna take a break i think that's a good place for us to break we'll be keeping on playing um in like five minutes time but i think that's a good place to wrap up part one of the video um if you're watching and you would like to see how the adventure concludes that's going to air at i believe 8 p.m uk time on friday the 19th of november um this has been a book week scotland event brought to you by the scottish book trust uh, the scottish book trust is a national charity that believes everyone living in scotland should have equal access to books if you have enjoyed this event please consider sharing your love of reading with others by making a donation at scottishbooktrust.com which is also where you can find the book week scotland rpg by adrian barber which we've been basing this game off today um thanks for watching uh see you next time